Dr. Stephen Cohen, you're a busy man here in Auckland. You've got, uh, what, uh, three presentations and workshops over the next few days? Are you coping? Coping well, thank you. Um, now, today you've been speaking about the interventions for chronic back pain and the role or not of epidural steroids. What were your conclusions? So I think there's a strong consensus uh, among medical practitioners, even among the, the biggest public antagonists towards interventional procedures, that epidural steroid injections work in well-selected patients. The problem arises in when they're overused. So there are doctors who exaggerate uh, their benefits to patients, and they are used in some individuals who are not likely or less likely to benefit. And so when procedures or medications are overused, it changes the risk-benefit ratio, both on a personal level for patients and for society, because there's a financial cost to these interventions as well. Tell us about the interest in your research. So my personal interest is I'm interested in doing you know, large-scale uh, clinical trials, so pragmatic trials um, that involve not just the ideal patients, but patients that we see in real life circumstances. And uh, I'm getting more involved in comparative effectiveness re uh, research. Um, so I think this is very important to patients because patients really don't care if, if they come and they're interested in a clinical trial, they don't want to be enrolled in a study that compares epidural steroid injections to a sham injection. Um, because they're not getting a sham injection if they go to a doctor's office. What would be more interested be more interesting to the patient is a study that compares two different treatments, such as an epidural steroid injection to a medication or a different kind of therapy. And they can be done either, we've done them both uh, open label and in a blinded fashion. And what's this going to mean at the end of the day for the patient? As I alluded to earlier, I think it's more important um, to the patient. I think that there's a trend towards more patient-centered research, so outcomes that are very important to, to patients. Um, can they function better? Can they, can they sleep better? What, what does it mean to a patient? And as I said, it's more important to, to know that, let's say, epidural steroid injections work better than medications, um, first-line medications for nerve pain, or they don't work better than, than performing the 53rd you know, study that compares epidural steroid injections to some kind of control injection. The 53rd study is not going to provide the definitive answer. Now, part of your interesting background, you're a retired U.S. Army colonel and you're the director of pain research at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center and you're presenting on Monday on military pain medicine. What's that talk going to be about? It's going to be about, uh, you know, pain issues that affect, you know, service members and the health care providers that, um, that, care for, that care for them. So I'm going to discuss, um, you know, the logistics of pain medicine um, you know, during wartime and, uh, you know, how to prevent the transition from, you know, acute pain after an injury to chronic pain and how to return you know, these injured service members um, to their pre-injury, you know, physical and, and psychological um, states. Now, in the military services from the days of Florence Nightingale and the Crimea War, obviously things have changed. How have they changed since those days? So, um, so some of the major advances, you know, in general for the military have been, you know, the development of, of you know, echelons or levels and now called roles of care. Um, so this, on a logistical basis, this will allow for the, um, you know, it will, it will maximize, you know, treatment um, of what could be many, you know, wounded service members with limited resources. And from a practical standpoint, I'm going to, you know, focus on, on uh, you know, pain medicine. So, you know, back in, you know, Civil War, the treatment of pain was done really with, um, you know, with a syringe of morphine. And that didn't change for, um, for probably close to 100 years. And now we have all of these different, you know, tools at our, our disposal. We have medications that might be able to prevent the transition from acute to chronic pain. We have um, lots of different, you know, minimally invasive, you know, procedures 
that can um, be done with, with very few resources, with limited resources, and that might be able to return you know, service members back to their units very quickly. And what does that mean for the soldiers and civilians who are impacted by warfare? So the so I, I do a lot of you know research that involves you know civilian hospitals. I'm also the the chief of pain medicine at, at Johns Hopkins, and so when we design you know clinical trials involving c civilians, there are certain outcome measures that are really important. Not just pain, um, things like you know function. Can you reduce your medication? Um, you know satisfaction. What the military really cares about is whether or not a service member can return to their unit and do their job. So they could feel better um, psychologically, they could sleep better, but if they can't do their job, they're not much use to the military. And so, um, so one of the things that I'm going to discuss in, in the talk are ways that the likelihood of a service member being returned to their unit can be increased. So pain medicine has uh, sort of adapted the model of psychiatry, and there are, very, there are many very strong parallels between um, you know, psychiatric illness and pain. So the strongest predictors of a bad outcome after an acute pain injury are, you know, people who are, you know, depressed or, you know, anxious. Um, sleep plays a role as well. So not only are people with, you know, pain likely to become depressed or anxious or not sleep well, but if you're depressed or anxious or you don't sleep well before an injury, you're more likely to, to have chronic pain. So what the psychiatrists and psychologists did is because people with PTSD or combat stress symptoms have, aside from combat injuries, the lowest return to duty rate if they leave a theater of, a theater of operations. Um, they've moved treatment towards theater. So they set up these you know, combat stress teams and they treat you know, service members you know, close to their units. And the third condition with the lowest return to duty rate so after, um, you know, combat injuries and, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder is back pain. So only 13% of service members with back pain who are evacuated from, you know, Iraq or Afghanistan return to their unit. So setting up a pain clinic, similar to the psychiatric model, you know, in theater has been shown to dramatically increase the return to duty rate. Well, we'll look forward to your presentation on Monday. Enjoy your time here in Auckland. Dr. Stephen Kern, thank you for talking to us. Thanks for inviting me.